this morning in the name of our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good to see you here this morning on this another beautiful day. Let our hymn book get ready real shortly and we'll get right into the singing and right on to the service. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we want you to know we are so thankful for this privilege that we have to come to the house of God come and lift up our voice to sing praises on your holy and righteous name. And Father, to greet one another with a handshake and just be glad that we're here. Father, you bless the same and bless all that we do today. Bless the word of God as it's preached. Father, we love you and thank you so much for loving us, keeping us through this another week. And ask you to bless today with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Let's turn to page 199. Page 199. Oh, come on, you faithful, stand with me. Let's greet each other in the name of the Lord.
Oh, God.
in a way that would cause our hearts to be right with you. Lord, bless us today. I know to ask for a blessing is a little over the top since we're already daily loaded with benefits. But Lord, we are blessed today because our Father blesses. And I'm so grateful for the blessing. I ask for a blessing today. I bless, pray, pray, Father, for those who are not able to be here today. Bless them. We miss them when they're not here. And so, Lord, go with us through this service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If I could title the message today, it would be the testimony of a lamb. The testimony of a lamb. That's a pretty generic title in that it doesn't really specify who the lamb is. And quite frankly, if you are a Christian today, you would be that lamb. I would be that lamb. And so this is a testimony of people who have been redeemed by a great shepherd. Amen. We are the lamb. He can be a shepherd because he's been a lamb. That's right. He was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And because he was the role of the lamb and has been, it qualifies him to be a shepherd of other lambs. This is often uh, quoted as a chapter of peace. Um, you regularly hear it at funerals. Um, to, to give peace and comfort. But for me, it's kind of a personal chapter. Amen. And it's why I chose it today. Uh, and I believe that the Lord uh, moved on me to, to speak on, chap on Psalm 23 because I was born on the 23rd day of the month. And so this has been a lifelong chapter for me. This has been my favorite even before I realized it would be a favorite. I was also born uh, in the month of March, so 323 is my birthday, and Psalm 23, verse 3, has become my life verse. And that's the one that says, He restoreth my soul, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. And we'll get into what that means here in just a minute. I just want to begin with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not going to preach like I normally preach. I'm going to preach and talk about what these verses mean to me. And I hope that I can convey something today that we can all find in common. That this is a test. If you believe in Christ Jesus, you've made him the Lord of your life. This should be all our testimony. It should be something that we all can hold to ourselves. And those first words say, the Lord is my shepherd. And that is a declaration from a sheep that I belong to the great shepherd. Amen. It's a statement of ownership. Amen. He is mine. That's my shepherd. You know, folks that are lost can't make a declaration like that. They can't say the Lord is my shepherd, that he leads them. This is a statement of ownership by those who claim Christ as their Lord and Savior. The great King, the great God, the great Shepherd, He belongs to me. You know, uh, in John chapter 10, and if you want to look over there, in fact, I think I'm going to just read it out there so I don't misquote it. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes a, a statement about the sheep. Beginning in verse 4 of chapter 10. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. Look over to verse, verse 14. I like this one. It says, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep. 
and I am known of mine. He claims us, and we claim him. He knows us, we know him. The Lord is my shepherd is a statement of ownership that not everybody can make. And that next line in verse 1 says, I shall not want. You know, a lot of name it and claim it folks will tell you. I shall not want means that I can have whatever I want. You know, I kind of compare that mentality to the parents in Walmart who have a little kid in the basket. They're rolling down each aisle. You know what those little kids do as they're going down the aisle? I want that. Can I have that? I want that. I want that. Drives me bonkers. I don't want to be behind a basket where there's a parent with a kid in the basket. Because they want everything. Right? That's not what this means. This means because I have a relationship with the great shepherd. I'm his and he is mine. I won't want for anything. I won't want for anything. Because whatever I need, he's going to supply it. And the longer I serve him, the sweeter he'll grow. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here's an interesting verse over in Proverbs. This could probably be more like a Bible study than just a message anyway. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 25 says, The righteous eat it to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. The belly of the wicked shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because he's going to take care of me, and I don't even have to worry about it. I didn't have to think, but you know the Bible says that he knows what we need before we even ask it. Amen. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about that. No. We don't have to worry our house when the bank account's empty if it's going to get filled or not. We don't have to, I mean, it's it's good to have a relationship where you, you talk to the Lord about what's going on in your life. That's but right. you need to know that the Lord knows what's going on in your life if you belong to him. That's right. You matter to him. He is yours, and you are his, Amen. and you will not have a need to want. This next, I, and I've heard so many sermons on this message before, and when you get down to the second verse, he says, He made me to lie down in green pastures and lead me beside the still waters. I, I hear this, this story often about what sheep are like and what they like and what's good for them. That's not exactly what I see in this verse. I don't necessarily see what sheep like. I'm not a sheep. I don't like grass. I don't care if the water's flowing or if it's still. I think there's something deeper here. I believe this is a spiritual application. And I want you to humor me just a little bit. I want you to look with me real quick in Revelation chapter 4. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4 is where the Spirit of the Lord caught up Paul, uh, uh, John, the, the, uh, John the Beloved, who was on the Isle of Patmos, writing all this good stuff down. He caught him up into heaven through a door. And if you start there in verse 2, it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Amen. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there's a rainbow round about the throne. That's not one of them old rainbows that's flying around here, one of them rainbow flags. That's not what that's about. This is a rainbow where God made a covenant with Noah and all the people of the earth and said he would not destroy the, the world again with a flood of water. And to remind, to put in as a reminder, he put a little rainbow up there around him, by, right by the throne, where he could see that all the time. Because I'm sure there's plenty of times where the Lord would like to just flood the whole place, right? right? Yeah. The Lord 
already said, the Bible says in Psalms that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Yeah. You know what? And that, th that right there, the throne, is that rainbow to remind him he's not ever going to flood the earth again. No, he's going to reserve the earth for fire later on. But it says when you look at the throne, and there's a rainbow round about, when you look at the throne, it says there's in sight like to an emerald. Anybody know what emerald is? If you ever watch The Wizard of Oz, you know the Emerald City was green. Let me tell you what I believe is on the throne. It didn't say that Christ sits on the throne. Did you notice that? It says one sits on the throne. I think that deserves some good study. If you're a Bible study, you need to figure out what that one means. It's very important. I believe when we get to heaven, and y'all can, and we can just make an agreement right now. We're going to check each other whenever we get there. You can check what I think. I'm okay with that. But let me tell you what I think's on the throne. It's that thing that was there before the beginning of time. The Bible says in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You want to know what I think is sitting on the throne? The word of God. It's just one. Just one word. The word of God. This book. Why? Because the word is from the beginning. It was already settled in heaven from the beginning. And I believe that what sits on the throne is the word of God. The Bible tells us there in that second verse of Psalms chapter 23. Make me to lie down in green pastures. Why? This is our food right here. That's right. This is our nourishment. Yes. The scripture tells us that we can go in and out, find pasture right here. And I believe that if we could somehow look behind the curtain of the spirit and see what this book looks like, other than the fact I believe it's a brilliant light. The scripture says that this is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I believe in life, it would really look like green. I think it would look like emerald. I think it would look green. Why? Because we're led into green pastures. And then if we'll go in and out, we'll find pasture like a sheep. And this is what we're going to get fed on right here. Is That's right. That's right. He says he leads me beside the still waters. Miss Rosemary ain't here today. I was going to make a little fun of the fact that she loves still water. Loves OSU. You know what I think when they were I think when they were founding that city, I think they had that verse in mind. Why? Because he leaves us beside the still water. Right. And I think that they wanted to make this place look attractive over there. Still water. Isn't that something? He leaves us beside still water. Why is that? The scripture tells us. Let me see where that's at. The scripture tells us. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that we're to be washed with the water of the word. Amen. Amen. See, that's why I believe that this is the green pasture, and it's also the water of the word. Amen. It's what we're to be cleansed with. This is what the Lord cleans us up with when we're dirty. He washes us with the water of the word. He leads us beside the still water that we're nourished and we're fed and we're cleansed. And then my favorite verse, he restored my soul. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, by one man's sin, death passed upon all flesh, all people. You know, we were doomed from the moment we were born. You know that? We were doomed before we were born. And one of the things when he becomes my shepherd and I become his sheep, he makes us a promise. He's going to restore our soul. You know, the scripture tells us that, that in the very beginning, God made man a living soul. And he put him into the Garden of Eden. And what happened whenever the fall happened in the Garden of Eden is man was separated from God. He was broken, lost, and doomed. But whenever God reaches down in the person of his shepherd and he takes us, his little sheep, he promises that he'll restore us. 
He'll restore us back to health, spiritual health. It's his promise. That's how he saves us. And how does he do it? By leading us in the paths of righteousness. So this particular word was published in 1611. So I want us to look at Psalm 1611. That's an interesting, that is an interesting verse. Psalm 1611 says, <clears throat> Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right, right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Why? Because his paths are the paths of life. And when we walk in the paths of life, he's going to be there with us. And when we're in his presence, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. We don't have to let our chin drag the ground and frown and be forlorn. We don't have to do that. Because he's with us. Amen. He's with us. He doesn't leave us. Why? Because he's going to restore our soul. Why is it important to him? Because his name's sake. His name is on the line. His reputation is on the line. I want to know right now who in this room that belongs to God, the Lord has failed you. We'll call. We will call. We will call the Guinness Book of World Records right now. And we'll get you entered right in. Because let me tell you something. God doesn't fail. He never fails. And whenever he restores our soul, he leads us into a path of righteousness. So that we can get it straight and we can get it right. And in that path is the path of life. And his presence is fullness of joy. Why? Because his name is on the line. And he will, the scripture tells us, and look with me in Psalm 138. I like the last verse of Psalm 138. It says, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. When God puts his hand to our life to work on us, he doesn't forsake us. He doesn't go, you know what? That was just too, too difficult. That one's just too complicated. That one is just too sin sick for me to fix. There is no soul like that. No. I love our song that we sing. To God be the glory, great things he has done. That verse that says, a perfect redemption. The purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender, who truly believes that moment from Jesus pardon, receives. I don't know if we really believe that. Huh? We, have, we sit in our little old chairs and smugly look at people whose lives have been decimated by sin, and we just go, God couldn't fix that guy. I bet God couldn't pick that woman up out of the ditch. You tell you something, when God found me and he picked me up, he had to get on both knees. And I think he probably had to reach all the way up to his armpits to pull me out of the mud. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Was it for Christ? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Oh, amazing pity. Grace unknown. And love beyond degree. Hey, I can relate to those lines. Because God loved me. And he picked me up. What did God save you from? Hmm? You guys look so righteous and holy to me, I can't even imagine you being in a state of sin where God had to pick you up. Let me tell you something. If you are a man that belongs to God, 
He is your shepherd. Mm -hmm. You are his sheep. He most surely picked you up. That's right. Some are a little broken more than others. But every one of us can relate to this story. Oh, the vilest offender who truly believes. I praise God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. That he will sanctify us and restore us. He can do it for us. He does it for his own name's sake. Verse 4 says, <clears throat> Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We know 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 7 says, We're not being given a spirit of fear. That's right. That's right. But a power of sound mind. When we go into that valley, John Rambo wrote a song back in the 60s that says, In the valley, he restored my soul. Amen. We have to go through the valley. And I just imagine when God's leading us in the paths of righteousness, I have to just believe that part of that path is through a dark valley. And I don't think we just go through them one time, Brother Darrell. You know why? Because I think in the valley is where some of those old familiar sins lay. Some of those familiar things that trip us up. And so God takes us with his little rod and his staff, and he leads us. I believe in this path that's almost like a little circle. Come up on a mountainside, then we come back down, and we go through the valley. Why? Because he wants us to keep going back through these things until they have no power over us. You know why, that, why it feels like the shadow of death? Because we come up on it, and we go, oh, no, there's that thing again. It's that thing that reaches out and tries to get me and pull me back down. I heard a great story. I think Dad told this story. He said... Uh, Indian man took a white guy to fish one day and took a little vulgar can full of, full of worms. And they're sitting there on the bank of the pond and they're fishing. Old Indian guy took the lid off the, co the coffee can and he threaded the hook and he threw it out there and the white guy said, ain't you going to put the lid back on that? He said, no, them Indian worms, they'll stay in there. He said, what? What do you mean? He said, yeah, if they try to get out, all the rest of them will pull them back down in there. Huh? You think about that. I think there are a lot of people who would like to escape their past. But every time they try and escape that past, always someone there is going to pull them right back down into the coffee can. And so what God does is he takes us with his little rod and his staff and he leads us into this path. And we go, oh no, I remember it gets way dark over here. There's that thing that he's trying to pull me back down. He leads us. And he leads us. And he leads us. So that thing over there has no power over us anymore. Why? Because in his path is fullness of joy. Because he doesn't leave us. He stays with us. That's right. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. <clears throat> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, the rod and the staff, there's two ends of that stick he carries. One is the, the blunt end, the bottom end that you know, always goes to the ground. That's the one that gets your backside when you get a little out of line, right? A little rod. You know, the scripture says if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Well, you know, it didn't say you spoil the child. Actually, what it says, if you spare the rod, you hate your child. Yeah. You know what it says that? Yeah. It does? Yeah. If you spare the rod, you hate your child. Why? Because children, and I'm a child, we need correction. The rod corrects us. The staff is the hook on the other end, the little crook. 
whenever I get too feisty and try to get away, he reaches out with a hook and pulls me back over into the path of life. You know what? You don't fear any evil, even though it hits your backside sometimes. Mm -hmm. Even though it grabs you around the neck and says, oh, get back over here. Why? Because it reminds us that he's with us. He's with us. He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. Yeah. Even to the end of the world. Right. Our lives can get very complicated. We can do things that are bad, can't we? And still be a believer. I mean, some things that are bad. Folks hear about some things we do, and they shake their head and they go, "What is that? What's that guy thinking?" The scripture tells us that if we get way out there and we get bad, the Lord will correct us. Hebrews chapter twelve tells us that whom the Lord loveth, He Chasten it. Amen. You know, there's two words in the Bible that are very similar, but they're not the same. Chastising and chastening. You know those are not the same word? To chastise means to just spank. Chastise, just spank. Wait, get a woman. But chastening is another thing. It's kind of like getting a woman, but it's correction for the purpose of making you more pure. Chasten. Chasten is to become chaste, like a, a virgin who's chaste and clean and pure. God can make us clean and pure again by chastening us. You know what the scripture tells us in those next few lines, though? That if he doesn't chasten you, don't belong to him. See, he doesn't leave us. He chastens us, corrects us. And if you want to know if you really are his sheep and not some old goat posing as a sheep, he'll chasten you. Yes, he will. And chasten you and get you in the right place again. That's right. Because that's what he does to his own. Right. And he won't do that. He won't fool with someone, someone or something that ain't his own. He ain't, he ain't, matter of fact, when he comes back, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Are you a sheep today? Scripture tells us in verse 5 there, chapter 23, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. <clears throat> I've heard a few messages on this and what this means. I'm just going to tell you what it means to me. I've heard, I've heard that it's a bargaining table where you sit down and you're in with enemies and hammer out a, uh, a peace deal. I've heard that before. I don't know if that's the truth. I'll tell you what it is for me. I think that the Lord prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies by setting a table for me as a, as a place to eat. He feeds me. Where he feeds me. And he does this in the presence of mine enemies. Why is that? Well, the scripture tells us if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You feed him. You feed him. You know, if you sit down at the table and the Lord is feeding you, people are going to see it. I don't know what it is about a table. But I've been in some places where I just have sat down at the table with two or three friends and we've Put some food on the table, and you know what happens? Other people get interested in your food. And they want to sit down with you. I don't care if they're your enemy or not. There's something about breaking bread with people that draws them to your table. <laughs> you know what happens whenever you can sit down with someone? You can hammer out a peace deal. Whatever you got between you, you can talk about it and get it, get it resolved. God wants us to have peace. He says, Thou preparest a, a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know what he does while you're sitting there? He puts oil on your head. Well, 
what's that about? David knew a little bit about some oil on his head. Samuel, Samuel went over there with a bucket of oil, and he was going to go over there, and he was going to anoint the next king. You find that in 1 Samuel. Went through every kid there. The Lord, didn't, the Lord never gave him leave to, to anoint one. He said, is this all your, Jesse, is this all your kids? I think David was an embarrassment to the family. You know why? All these other kids, these other boys were bulky, they were big, they were masculine looking, they had, I believe they had dark hair, probably real well beards, and Jesse said, no, well, we got one more. He's out tending the sheep. If, 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 the, if the prophet came and said, bring all your boys to the house, and you don't bring that one. I think he was an embarrassment. Why? Because he was a little scrawny guy at that time. He was ruddy, red-faced, red hair. You've heard that phrase before, old red-headed stepchild. You've heard that, haven't you? Yeah. I think David was an embarrassment, so they just stuck him out there because there's no way God would want that one. Oh, but that was the one he wanted. And he showed up. David told Samuel, up, oh, arise, anoint him. He's the one. Uh -huh. And when David said, thou anointest my head with oil. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been excluded from that affair? And to know you, you probably would never be picked for anything because you're old red-headed stepchild. And to come into the house. And the Lord said, that's he says, Samuel got up and he anointed his head with oil and he blessed him. And at that time, the Spirit of the Lord fell on David. David's trying to convey something to us when our heads are anointed with oil, especially in the presence of our enemy. We have the favor of God on us. We have the favor of God on us. So who's going to have the balance of power at the table? Oh, the person with the oil on their head. When God does this thing with us where he restores us, he takes us on this journey so that the things that once had hold on us no longer has hold of us, then he sets us out front in front of everyone. Just like he did David. He anoints our head with oil. Up, runs over. I was coming home last night from Muskogee. I love hanging out with my sister. We do fun things like go to Ollie's and look through their books. We were coming back from Muskogee last night and I turned on a hymn on the radio, on, the, on my phone. It was an old Fanny Crosby hymn that says, One day the silver cord will break. Amen. And I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I awake within the palace of the king. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Let me tell you something. We were sharing a hamburger. I couldn't even hardly eat. You know why? My cup. Was running over. You know, the therapist will tell you, well, I don't know, are you, a, are you a positive person or a negative person? Do you see the cup half empty or the cup half full? Let me tell you something about my cup. It ain't neither of those things. My cup runs over. That's right. It's not half anything. Why? Because the favor of the Lord will rest on a person that's a Christian. A person that's committed their life to him. Their cup will run over. My cup was running over last night. The final verse says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy. You know, the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 7, 
that a good tree will bring forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree will bring forth corrupt fruit. What is good fruit? Well, the scripture tells us in Galatians that good fruit is this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, nine of them fruit. Right here it says goodness. You know, goodness is in that list. Goodness, surely goodness and mercy. Why does it throw mercy in there? Well, it's a requirement. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, What, what hath the Lord required of thee? To love justice. Seek justice. Do justly. Love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Three things that were required. And one of those is to love mercy. And so the scripture tells us all the days where I've, I've heard people talk about those are my two hounds that follow me. Those aren't hounds, buddy. No. Hey, that's the stuff you leave behind. Let me tell you what got left behind in Moore Norman area when that tornado rolled through. Destruction. Destruction. But when we roll through as Christians, believers, those who have trusted in Christ Jesus, we leave behind us goodness and mercy. You know, this little old temple that we dwell in, this this body, this flesh. It's the house of the Lord. Did you know that? This is a house. It's the Lord's house. And once you get saved, once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get the privilege of dwelling in God's house. Because he converts this to his house. Which is kind of cool because when it comes time to die or go out in uh, the catching away of the church, we just go from this house to that house. We just upgrade you know what David said about this house? He said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen. Are you contented in your house, the house of the Lord, being his doorkeeper? Because that's what we are in these temples. Our doorkeeper, we're a doorkeeper to make sure that nothing evil gets in the door. And that's a pretty tough ticket right now in this world that we live in. Because there's all kinds of evil stuff trying to get in the door. Trying to get in and get in front of your eyes so you can see. Why? So that it'll knock you off that path. Knock you off course. So let me ask you. This is the testimony of a believer. We claim him. He cleans us. He leads us and purifies and sanctifies us. Then he sets us in a place where our enemies can see us. What happens when the enemies of God start coming to us? We're able to convert them. We're able to convert them. And we get to live in the house of the Lord forever. Is this your testimony? You know, despite the fact that I can personalize this for me, it should be your testimony too. What part of this journey are you on? Are you in that path? Are you in this, this little cycle where he's leading you through paths of righteousness? And you're going through these places where you it's tough to get through and you get maybe sometimes a little sidetracked, or you get maybe you fall and you have to get back up, or he has to get his little hook and hook you around the neck and pull you back up where are you at in your walk with the Lord. Maybe we need to go back to square one. Have you claimed him as your shepherd? Have you claimed him as your shepherd? Can you say the Lord is my shepherd? And do you know that whenever he, you say he is my shepherd, he can say, I know my sheep, they know my voice, they hear me, and they follow me, and another they won't follow? Do you have a relationship with him? What does your testimony sound like? We're going to have a word of prayer. And this in this next few minutes will be your opportunity to, to make sure that everything is right between you and the Lord. So why do I need to do that? Because I believe our time is short. I believe that the church age is wrapping up. And we need to have our account. We need to have our account square with the Lord. We need to keep a real low balance on our account with the Lord. Scripture tells us if we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All you have to do is ask him. Why? Because he's a gentle, loving, forgiving, and merciful shepherd. Heavenly Father, I just want to give thanks for thy word. Lord, how the word of God shows us who we are and where we are and where we belong. And I just pray for every soul in this building today. That every person in this building can say, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord, and wherever we're at, whether we've gone through all the paths that of, of, of righteousness that Lord that sometimes trip us up and we have to keep working through that so it no longer has power over us or maybe there are some here who are toward the end who they have there at the table now and they're in the presence of their enemy and their heads have been anointed with oil I don't know this is, there's a place on this path for everyone but I just pray Lord that whoever is on this path today would make sure that they have an account that settled with the Lord. I believe our time is short, Lord, and I believe it would I believe it would behoove everyone in this room to do a soul search. The scripture tells us in Psalm 139, search me, O God. Try me, know me. Make sure there's no sinful or wicked thing in me. And Lord, that's what I pray today, and I just pray this for those who are here today. And as we give an invitation, Lord, if there's anyone who needs to do business with the Great Shepherd today, I just pray, Father, there'd be a freedom in the room that, Lord, any spirit that would, would be here to, Lord, keep somebody from doing what they need to do, I just pray the spirit would be bound, and the blood of Christ would prevail in this place. Lord, bless the service, the invitation service today. Thy will would be done. Jesus' name.